one of the people who used closed systems for how many years now? More than 25 half, years. Half, half, a, half, half circle. circle. 25 years. 25, okay, a quarter. So, so uh, would you address the issue of evolution from closed systems to MIEC then? So, uh, when you asked by, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak today. And I thank you, uh, Professor K <coughs> Anastasiadis and all the organizing committee. I don't take it for granted, it's a great privilege. Um, but when you get the, you're being requested to give the evolution off, you already feel that you're quite, quite old. And I'm listening to some of the comments. Uh, some of the comments have been said, and that I've, I've been discussing the same question back in 1994 with my colleagues. That means things need still to change, and the main question, if it's so good, why it didn't capture even earlier. So I'm hoping to answer some of these questions in my talk. So it's been a quite a journey, a quarter of a century journey that I will be speaking about. How do I make forward from here? Yeah. So we are going to talking about extra corporeal technology, and everybody knows this slide that John Gibbon gave us the privilege of doing the first case was in May of, uh, 23rd of May of 1953, and he introduced the heart-lung machine to practice and not revolutionize cardiac surgery. The conventional cardiopulmonary bypass surgery, unfortunately, didn't change much since that time, since 1953. And most people practice these days using this conventional circuit. It's membrane oxygenator, using a roller pump, using non-coded circuits with an open system with open cardiomy reservoir. <coughs> um, they use pump suctions. The prime is crystalloid prime, using the gold standard of full anticoagulation with a target ACT of 480 seconds, and very degree of systemic hyper hypothermia. But we all know that this strategy has some flaws. And what are the problems? Essentially, three problems. One is very obvious. There is contact of blood with foreign surface, either plastic or air, that introduces or initiates cascades of events that we all are aware of is that, is <coughs> that are disastrous. The second problem is human evolution. And the third problem is hypothermia. These are the problems. Now, what are the pathophysiological consequences? There are also three major problems which we all try to fight, and every practicing cardiac surgeon is fighting every day. It's the intense systemic inflammatory response with all these consequences, thromboembolism, and coagulopathy. But what we end up is organ dysfunction of the brain, which we either failing to monitor and certainly have difficulties to prevent injury, organ dysfunction of the heart, the low cardiac output, the uh, ARDS type lung injury, the acute kidney injury, and obviously bleeding, which people are looking at all the time. So those are the clinical consequences. But now one of the most important answers to the question uh, that has risen is why people don't use it because we have to get out of the comfort zone. And life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So back in 1993, a group of us at Boston Medical Center, led by Dr. Richard Chimin, who was my chief and mentor, Dr. Gabriel Aldea, Dr. Harold Lazar, <coughs> and myself, which I was much younger, with a lot more air and less gray, and joined later by Christophe Barfaton in Europe, uh, were trying to get out of our comfort zone and change our practice. And we thought, how can we change it? What can we eliminate? in the conventional circuit and the conventional cardiopulmonary bypass technology and move forward. So we had the vision and we had a mission because we wanted to do good for our patients. So we came up with a strategy of 10 components, which are the 10 commandments of the biocompatible perfusion strategy that includes membrane oxygenator, and that didn't change much, but we switched from a roller pump to a centrifugal pump we switch our circuits to tip-to-pip heparin-coded circuits. We uh, use both uh, duroflow-coded and commuter coded We switch from an open system to a closed system. We eliminated the cardiotomy reservoir, and we minimize our prime volume. Then we use the next step and reduced our systemic anticoagulation. We almost eliminated hypothermia, except deep hypothermic circulatory arrest needed for aortic heart surgery. 
And we added two other components, the routine use of antifibrinolytic agents, and actually we do use routinely cell saver because everybody is concentrating on using cell saver for saving blood, but it also washes some of the inflammatory mediators. The second reason why we are <coughs> not using it is because when you make so many changes and you get out of your comfort, you have to balance efficacy and safety. And certainly, you lose some safety nets. And when you use the safety nets, that's why Dr. al uh, discussion about using modular circuit, it is absolutely necessary. If you want to introduce this system into your practice, you have to start from big and then go and trim it down, not vice versa. Start from a type four, going to down to one when it's possibly. Otherwise, no one will ever feel comfortable with that. And there are some major safety points which unfortunately in, in my 25 years of practice, I encountered. One, not all coatings are the same. When I, all our studies, which I will show you, uh, use heparin coated, but there are other, for TIVA coating, and not all of them are the same. So if you decide to use low anticoagulation, you have to have evidence that it is indeed safe. So if you reduce your ACT to 300 or 250 in cabbage and you use other coating other than the Duraflow or the Comida, you might not be safe when you have cloning. Second, which I realized when I moved from Boston after almost 20 years to Israel, that those surfaces are very uh, sensitive to extreme heat. And we had issues of clotting of the system and we figured out that this coating actually deteriorated while being stored in extremely, or trans transported or stored in high temperature. Using closed system heparin coating circuit requires changing your practice. You cannot have stasis in your system. So once your system stop, you have to replace the blood with crystalloids. Recently, and that's become over a problem in the last five years, we have a problem with inconsistent heparin potency. And this graph in the middle, right here, uh, in the middle of the, uh, of the uh, slide, show that three different heparins have, in order to reach an ACT target of 480 requires three different concentrations. So this is a real problem that's introduced by the heparin industry. So the one problem is system cloning, and the other major problem is how you use, how to manage your air. And again, when you use a closed system or you eliminate the reservoir completely, you may encounter a significant problem in air management, and you can find yourself with the heart, or more importantly, the brain full of air. So in order to implement it, safely, and, and safe transition from conventional to wild compatible must be a team effort. So I think one of the great strengths of MEX is the uh, fact that it actually you have here in the room and the society has a buy-in of the anesthesiologists, perfusionists, I don't see so many nurses, uh, <coughs> uh, surgeons, and all the stakeholders are in one room discussing those issues. This is a key, and again, this is from my Boston days, from head of the Charles Regatta, the largest uh, uh, competition of, of those in the world. Another important, uh, another important um, um, concept of moving safely into this technology is a transition from conventional to biocompatible or to MEAC should be gradual. You want to move from a morbidly obese to a beautiful woman. If you do it too fast, you either die or you go back and you'll be morbidly obese. And that's what happens in your, in, your, in, in your new hospital. They move it too quickly and they die. So, and the second point I was already alluded and was very nicely uh, pointed out by Dr. Lassois, with the use, you have to use model circuits. You have to be able to include more instantaneously a reservoir if you don't have it up front. You want to include instantaneously a, uh, a pump sucker. You, you have to have it in your hand in order not to lose your safety nets, particularly if you're gonna implement it in, uh, in high risk complex cases, which we've been done, I've been doing it for 20 years now. I've moved away only from cabbage only, and I'll show you some. Regarding the physiology of it, so early days, <coughs> we looked at almost every component looking at some of the physiology, uh, either us or our, our friends. So moving to centrifugal pump, it's not just safer, there's some merit to it, because there is less damage 
to uh, uh, blood components. And you can look at the, uh, this s uh, simple study from the European Journal back in 2000. You can see that there is less uh, neurological injury just by switching the pump. Use of tip to tip heparin coating and closed system. Um, this is one of our, actually, they took it from our own study when we looked at the electron microscopy, and you can see how the uh, oxygen looks at the heparin coated circuit and the regular circuit. And this translates into this is one of our earlier studies. Uh, PI is Gabriel Aldea, and we published it as a prospective randomized trials of 240 patients, showing that. Um, uh, the outcomes are much better. So this is a level one data prospective randomized trial. And we also show that it decreased total donor exposure. Look at the year. This is 1996. Um, so this is not new. Uh, when we eliminated the cardiotomy reservoir, we did it for a reason. It's not just because we thought it is good and let's take a look at it because there is a study again done by us that show that there is a significantly, uh, there is an attenuation of platelet activation, thrombin generation. So the physiology behind it, which has been a little bit slicking, it's actually there. We looked at all the physiological aspects of every single component of our system, and that's why it is advantageous to attenuate it or reduce it or eliminate it, but have it as a backup in a modular system. And this is another study looking at neurological injury secondary, but if it, what happened to uh, our brain when you eliminate the cardiotomy reservoir and looking at neurospecific NLAs and uh, S100 in the brain with or without the cardiotomy, using, just by eliminating the cardiotomy reservoir, there's significant, <coughs> significant decrease in those brain injury parameters. Again, this is prospective randomized. Then we looked at what happened if we minimize the prime volume, which is one of the most important concepts of my act. And this is a study that I was heading when we uh, did a retro retrograde autologous prime with a prospective randomized trial and <clears throat> with or without trap priming. And we showed that we decreased the, uh, substantially the um, hemodilution and we uh, therefore decreased the halogenic blood transfusion adding component of it. Um, one of the most important barriers is people, particularly the perfusionist, don't feel comfortable reducing systemic anticoagulation. And we did have problem because everybody presented their good results. When we first started using it, we decreased the AACT to, to 215 cabbage cases, but we had two intraoperative clots and intraoperative uh, stuck valves when we did mitral valve replacement. So we realized that this is not really close when you have a blood air interface. So we actually switched our practice, and in valve cases and in aortic cases, we actually use a target ACT of 350, still substantially below the 480 target uh, when we use conventional circuit. But not only we switched our ACT, we realized that ACT back then is not an accurate measurement, and we must use precise heparin and protamine titration using the <coughs> using a machine. Uh, and I think without it, you cannot reliably. Uh, practice the whole strategy. <clears throat> we talk about hypothermia and actually, and then we did this, pros this is another second set of prospective randomized data the trial uh, by Gabriel and our group um, on looking just on the impact of reducing systemic anticoagulation. So if you use a MIAC system and use full systemic anticoagulation and full and, and conventional circuit, you're probably gonna have a much less effect on physiology. And that's why when we, we wrote it as a Ten Commandments, so I put it as a Ten Commandments, but if you just eliminate, use only half of the principles, you effect the physiological effects which be substantially less. And <clears throat> we showed it. I'm gonna skip, this is some of the effect on anticoagulation by the antifibrinolytics. And uh, I wanted to show this slide on routine use of cell saver. Um, and not only that, but soaking and rinsing and sponge and string transfusion guidelines. The first, two report, the first two cases we did with this strategy were on Jehovah Witness cases. That was back in 1994. So uh, it was a very effective strategy. And we looked at this uh, thing when you can see that there is substantial reduction in IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, TNF, all those inflammatory cytokines when you use cell service. So I should say so we believe is a good component. 
So just give you the outlines of some, this is my personal CS and half of the time I was at BMC, and you can see that uh, we had quite reasonable results in all patients, um, and the numbers are quite big, because they're not randomized. And I was lucky enough to collaborate with uh, Professor Barfaton and see if this can be uh, implemented as a whole strategy in Europe and Israel when I moved to Israel back in uh, <coughs> 2008. And this is the result of a only on cabbages, close to 1,000 patients down between our two, two centers when we essentially had identical practice that was adopted. Uh, Christoph adopted our strategy from Boston Medical Center, and this is cabbage only. And we can see that the results were quite promising. We, uh, I insisted using the STS database um, as our data collection tool. And that gives, they gave us the opportunity to look at uh, not just the observed mortality, but observed versus expected. And you can see that in our study, we had a mortality of 1.4%, but the, observed, the expected was 2.0, so about 60% was expected. The reoperation, which seems quite high, but given our, the fact that in, at Hadassah, two-thirds of our patients were urgent, and 90% of patients were either one or two antiplatelets, so the expected uh, bleeding was 6% and the observed was 4% and very low rates, 0.9% of stroke and the external wound infection uses this strategy. So this strategy in our hands, both in, the, both in uh, Anger in France and in our group at Hadassah was quite effective. The same, with, uh, we only had 34% of our patient transfused, but not only the incidence of transfusion was extremely low, uh, the magnitude, we had an average of one point, of those transfused, the average was one, 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 uh, one uh, unit, and very, very, very little use of uh, other blood products like <coughs> cryoplatelets and FFP. So over the journey of 25 years, I think um, I am absolutely convinced that biocompatible cardiopulmonary bypass strategy effectively reduces hemostatic activation. We have shown it. It attenuates inflammatory response. So this is the physiology behind the improved clinical outcomes. It actually works. But there must be a key safety points. First, it's a team effort. Everybody needs to have a bind and get educated and trained. There must be a gradual implementation. If you try to do it up front, move to a type 1 circuit when you do aortic a uh, major early case, it's not going to work. Patients are going to die from bleeding or other problems. Therefore, you must have a modular cardiopulmonary bypass system. Not all coatings are the same. And if you want to, if you are uh, going to reduce your anticoagulation to a level that we used to now, I, you know, in, in cabbage 250 and in valve 350, then you have to make sure that you're using the right coating. Not all heparins are the same. You have to look at what formulas your, or what, uh, what your, pharma your pharmacy provides you and make sure that it is indeed potent, otherwise you're gonna have system clotting. You cannot rely on, on ACT only and you must have heparin titration systems to uh, look into it. You must avoid system uh, stasis during the case and you have to consider uh, things that you don't usually uh, consider as a surgeon but look where, where are you practicing, which environment. So practicing in Europe is usually not a problem, despite the global heating, but in Israel, when the temperature frequently in the storage places reaches 45 degrees centigrade, this is a major factor that actually caused us to have two, th two or three cases of clotting in the system because of destroying uh, the, yes, the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oz. Um, I think your results about biocompatibility are already in the guidelines. So it is not just considered, it is in the guidelines that MIEG is a closed system and it is uh, biocompatible. So before going on, since we have with us uh, Rob Groom, who is from AMSECT and uh, he is a commentator, I want to have uh, his comments on uh, uh, Rob Baker's talk about uh, what you have heard from uh, uh, O. Sapira, who was uh, in uh, Mass General in Boston, and also I will include a question to him because I was with, uh, with them uh, uh, from AMSECT in the States, and uh, when I was discussing about, uh, we were discussing about these systems and uh, uh, the technology, they were claiming that this is a European technique. So why is that, Rob? Is this uh, 
uh, still on, or uh, have you changed your mind according to what you've heard and what is in the guidelines? There's a great deal of interest in this technology in the U.S., but I have to tell you that currently the use of this technology in North America is very limited. I know very few centers. Uh, Dr. Shapiro, I remember well your, your uh, papers from the early 90s, and uh, clearly you and your colleagues were the voices crying in the wilderness about heparin coding, closed <laughs> systems, and it was very compelling what you shared and then, but and you did you did manage to convince some to adopt that technology. But I have to say today, less than five percent of centers in the U.S. use closed systems. So, um, good enough has become acceptable here. Unfortunately, good enough has become acceptable, but. I'm so encouraged by the work that this group is doing. And um, I would like to share one slide, if I may, if, if I may have the screen for a moment, I'd like to share one slide because I, I think it, it, uh, can, can you see my screen? Not yet. I think where we are today is. Rob, we can't see it. This, your group has, has, developed a great deal and pulled together the generalizable knowledge about this technology. You've written the, the consensus paper, you've done the meta-analysis. This, this technology is now accepted in the EAC standards. And, it, and so there's so much written that it will compel centers to look at this technology again. What centers need, if centers are gonna improve or in a, and adopt this technology, it's going to take a lot of generalizable evidence, but the next thing that will be required is context knowledge. As centers look at the outcomes reported in the studies, in the good studies, they will be compelled to, to think and take some intelligent action and consider moving to, to these platforms to reduce AKI, AFib, and transfusions, and, and also um, um, heart issues and heart failure. I think that this, there's so many benefits that are being demonstrated by all of this evidence. The next thing is needed is context knowledge. As Dr. Shapiro mentioned, he, he subscribed to the STS and put that data in front of his surgeons so they could look at different, different platforms and, or different surgeons and how they performed. And we need to do the same thing looking at these platforms. So what we need is what Rob alluded to. We need registries to further advance this and to give the centers the context knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we have to go on, and uh, it's with us uh, Alexander Wachba, the president of uh, the EBCP. Uh, Alex, it's 